Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of The Written Page, a podcast that you will be able to listen to on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez. I'm talking to you from Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America. And today we have a very special show because uh, we've been talking with um, different writers um, and in some other uh, of the podcasts that you can find on the channel uh, with musicians, different kinds of authors and historians and critics. But today we're going to be talking to an award-winning translator born in the United Kingdom but now living in Bulgaria, the founder and director of Small Stations Press, where among other things he publishes quality contemporary Galician literature in English translation. He's also a writer, a poet, an essayist, a photographer, has done just about everything. Someone for whom translation is life, and life is translation. I'm talking about Jonathan Dunn, who's joining us from Bulgaria. Bienvenido al programa. Jonathan, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Anton. It's very kind of you to have me, and I'm very happy to be here. Well, I'm glad that you answered our call here on uh, the written page. And... Um, I was really uh, interested in your work as a translator of Galician literature texts uh, because I grew up in the northwest of Spain in Galicia. My father is a uh, poet and a writer, and a lot of the um, um, people whose books you've translated uh, were friends of his, are friends of his, and I remember growing up around them. But before we talk about all that, I would like to know, Jonathan, were you an avid reader as a child? I was, but I, but not in Galician. I didn't come across Galician until I left university. Uh, as a child, I was reading mainly English literature, French literature, uh, and classics, Greek and Latin literature, which is what I studied at university. I, I was a great lover of ancient Greek and still am in many ways. I continue to read it and uh, would like also to translate from ancient Greek at some stage. Uh, I came across Galician later after I finished university and I decided I wanted to spend some time abroad uh, outside the United Kingdom and I wanted to go and experience a different culture and see how other people thought and lived. Uh, and I came across the city of Lugo and they talked about how it had this amazing Roman wall. It was surrounded by this uh, really massive structure uh, and had very beautiful countryside and uh, this own culture and language uh, that was spoken about. And I thought, well, that would be a very interesting place to go. And so I didn't want to go to a big city. I didn't want to go to a, you know, a capital like Madrid or Barcelona, though I did end up in Barcelona for, for some years. Uh, but that was later on. Uh, I wanted to go somewhere a little uh, smaller. Lugo, I'm, I can't remember exactly, is maybe 100,000 people. So it's a sort of average size mm -hmm. town. And it was a very good, very positive experience. And I, I very quickly uh, discovered about the language and, and uh, culture of Galicia. Uh, but obviously, having studied classics at university, it helped a lot because uh, these are Romance languages. So uh, a lot of the words are coming from Latin. Uh, Latin is a, a wonderful uh, help in, in learning modern languages. We don't seem to appreciate that very much now because Latin and Greek are falling by the wayside a little bit. And I'm very sorry about that because... Latin is extremely useful for Romance languages, and I think ancient Greek, even more so, uh, may not be so obviously useful for learning modern languages, but it has a wonderful effect on your mind. I think it gives you this ability to see around things uh, rather than just to see inside things, and that's a very useful ability to have. So uh, I tried to sort of, having gone through that process at school and university with Latin and Greek, uh, to uh, discover a different culture and to modernize my knowledge, if you like, by, by learning a, a modern language that was related to them. And it was a very good experience, as I say. Was that uh, first contact with Galician uh, through a, a book, through literature, through a person that you met? Uh, how did that happen? Well, I got the job uh, teaching English uh, in Lugo, and I was doing that for a year. And the first year, to be honest, uh, I had a, an old textbook I picked up secondhand, and was teaching myself Spanish. Uh, and then I went to Barcelona uh, after one year and ended up at the Central University there and uh, very quickly bumped into Camilo Fernández Baldeorras, a Galician teacher there, and he mm -hmm. was very interested to hear about my experience in, in Galicia. I spent the first year doing a, a diploma of Hispanic studies and then immediately switched to 
to Galithian. So it was very much through the um, influence of this uh, Galithian teacher, Camilo Valdeorras, who was a, a wonderful influence, gave me a lot of time and uh, taught me the language through the Shunta courses. Uh, and I was I was very grateful for that. It was funny, though, when I arrived in Barcelona and I, I first of all did a diploma of Hispanic studies. So it was Spanish and uh, Latin American literature and things like that. And I, I had a, remember having a big argument uh, with the Spanish teacher, this wonderful woman uh, who started to, to teach us the present perfect. And I'd been in Galicia in Spain for a year already and I'd never heard this tense. I have been. For me, it was I was. Uh, and uh, in, you know, eido instead of fung, and I was very perplexed to, after a year of having been in the country, to discover that there was a whole verbal tense that I hadn't been using and hadn't known anything about. <laughs> and she really had to convince me that the present perfect existed, because uh, as you know, but maybe your listeners don't, it's not used in the Galician language. The Galician language only uses the past simple and uh, doesn't really use the present perfect at all. So it was very amusing for me to find that out. The other thing I noticed was that uh, people were convinced I was Galician because I had such a strong accent. But of course, for me, I didn't know it was an accent. Uh, for me, it was the only accent. And uh, they wouldn't ask me, are you from Galicia? They would say, which part of Galicia are you from? <laughs> so I would say, well, Lugo and and not correct their mistake and just think, well, there you go. Uh, so it's a nice mistake to make. Something like I'm that. I'm very happy about that. Something like that used to happen to me, actually, when I first came to the United States and I was doing a radio show in Nashville and uh, people would yeah. call the show and they would say, what part of Texas are you from? And uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was nice to hear that as a, as a foreigner, nice. you know, isn't it? But what you said about uh, Latin Greek is very interesting because I totally agree with that. And I was very fortunate uh, growing up that in high school and then at the university I was able to take Latin and Greek. It really made my learning uh, some modern languages a lot better and it uh, yeah. expanded my knowledge of grammar which I think is something that now as a professor uh, of Spanish in the United States I think uh, many students are lacking in their knowledge of grammar. Yeah, and I, I've also heard it said that uh, the study of ancient Greek uh, uh, gives you a sense of virtue and it may sound a strange thing to say but I always have the impression that after studying Greek for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour I feel like a better person. I, I feel that I've been lifted somehow uh, and that's a wonderful thing and I, I've never quite had that experience learning another language uh, as I have with Greek. It's it's almost as if there's something in the language that, that uh, improves you somehow and also I think the fact that it's a so-called dead language that I would never wish to call it that, but it's not a language that you can go out on the street and speak, it means that you have to have this uh, uh, surrounding vision when you're when you're learning it. And I think it gives you this great ability to see outside the box. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really, I really think it, uh, Latin and Greek, certainly Greek, uh, are subjects that we, we should be encouraging our children to study and not not laying aside because they're, they're maybe not of financial value or going to get you a job or something like that, but they, they help you as, as a person, I think, and they, they improve you as a person and, and they give you a cultural basis. And these things are very important, not only to study, uh, you know, subjects that may have a direct uh, impact on the job that you're then going to do, but, uh, but also that improve you as a, as a person. And for me, ancient Greek does that. You know, not to not to say that the the the, the New Testament is written in ancient Greek and <laughs> uh, some classics of ancient Greek literature and Hel Hellenistic poetry and Church Fathers from the uh, fourth century Cappadocian Fathers were writing in Greek as well. So it's an extremely useful language to be learning. But I I think in the West in in England, for example, or Spain, or or in America, I, I can't really speak because I, I've not been there. there there's a great ignorance. Uh, towards uh, Eastern Europe and the culture here mm -hmm. and uh, we're in danger of seeing this part of the world only as a sort of place to go on holiday and I, I think uh, we really need to learn a, a lot more about these cultures, the Balkan world and further east Georgia I went to recently because uh, I think they have uh, very strong spiritual values and uh, and uh, we could learn a lot from them, uh, especially in, in the world we live in today where 
in the West, it seems it's purely about uh, financial value. And I think uh, as a people, since most of us, you know, we should have our food needs and housing needs seen to, those are very basic things, you know. Uh, I think then rather than just making money, we should be thinking about improving ourselves and uh, uh, thinking on a cultural level. And I, I think we have a lot to learn from the East, which by which I mean Southeast Europe and uh, and countries like uh, Georgia uh, and Russia also. Uh, Russia gets very negative press, but, uh, you know, I, I have contact with Russian people through my son's school and... Uh, and uh, I have very, very, very good uh, opinion of them. But all you ever seem to read about in the press is, is negative stuff about the government or about, you know, what's been happening there. And I, we have to go beyond that. And this has to do with translation, because that's about uh, appreciating other people's values and appreciating uh, other people's uh, inventions and abilities to tell stories and where they've come from and what they've suffered. Russia has suffered a great deal in the past century. Uh, you know, you think of the Second World War, when I was at school, it was almost as if uh, Britain and America had won the Second World War with the help of France. And come on, uh, you know, Russia had a lot more dead during the Second World War than we did, not to underestimate the dead that died from our countries, but there were also a lot of uh, casualties, uh, more casualties from, from Russia. And I think we need to, to be appreciating one another and entering dialogue with one another rather than uh, creating walls between uh, or distrust between uh, between different nations. It's very important for me that, and I think that's one of the main reasons I I've, I'm still involved with translation now, uh, sort of almost thirty years uh, on from leaving university. Uh, I think one of the other reasons I'm still involved with translation now, apart from the fact that I believe in it, well, there are a couple of reasons, but I think one of them is also that I'm very glad to be using something that I learned at university, because I think otherwise <laughs> you can very often learn something at university and then put it to one side and go and do a job and never think about what you learned at school or at university again. And I, I think it's very good to be using skills that I first practiced uh, and honed when I was uh, a university student. And so I'm, I'm very happy about that. I could also speak about what you mentioned in my translation is life and life is translation because I think we really are translators and it's very important to think in that way that everything we do is translation things pass through us even life even our children you know we don't invent life uh, it's given to us so it passes through us and we have to give it meaning and extract meaning ourselves and I think that's very much like the process of translation similarly breathing is an act of translation we take air we don't invent the air I didn't make the air. The air is there. And we take the oxygen or what we need and we uh, exhale carbon dioxide or whatever it is. But there is a process of translation there. Same with food. You take things into your stomach and you translate and you extract energy. So all the time what we're doing is translation. But I think in the world we live in, there's a, a frightening tendency to want to be authors. At which point you're immediately saying that uh, something belongs to you. Something, this is mine and uh, it's my property. And once you do that, once you start to see yourself as an author, despite the fact that all things are given to us, uh, even the land we live on, and we say that this is my house, but I didn't make the land, and I didn't make the materials that went into the house, and I probably didn't even make the house. So, you know, I think we have to, to be a little relative about these things, and, and to think more like translators than, than, than like authors, because once you do that, and you draw a line, and you say, this is mine, and it's, it's very obvious that mine and line are connected, um, you're going to have conflict, and you're going to have distrust, and you're going to have walls going up. It doesn't matter if it's the Berlin Wall or any other wall, or walls that we make ourselves. It, it doesn't matter. The point is, you're creating a gap, a chasm uh, between people. And I think if you begin to think like a translator, uh, it changes your your values, your way of thinking, thinking about things. You become more humble, more accepting, hopefully. And uh, and I think that is the only way we can go forward as people. Uh, You're listening to the voice of Jonathan Dunn here on the written page. He's a translator and a writer, and he is also the director of Small Stations Press. Is joining us from. Bulgaria. 
And it's very clear from what you're saying, and I couldn't agree more with uh, everything you have said. Uh, it's very clear from what you say that uh, language is uh, something that's very important to you, and I think we share that. I remember as a kid growing up in Spain and realizing uh, not only that there were different languages around, because in Galicia, Spanish was spoken and Galician was spoken, and then Portugal was just 25 minutes away, and going across the border, you were in a different country, and they spoke a different language. That was similar, but it was different enough that you could tell that it was different, you know. Uh, also remembering um, uh, how, uh, because uh, I was growing up in Europe, uh, even though the European e Union hadn't begun yet, uh, a lot of the products that you, can, that you could find in the supermarket or anywhere, uh, you know, the different boxes were written in different languages from different countries in Europe. And I remember just cutting out those and keeping them and trying to make sense out of what was written in Greek or, uh, you know, in German or Dutch or something like that. Um, all of this to ask you, when did you start getting interested in languages and in translation, Jonathan? Well, I think uh, my first experience was was when I started learning Latin at the age of 10. And I remember we had to translate. The first sentence I ever translated was Caecilius est pater. Caecilius is father. Caecilius is a father. Caecilius is the father. Cecil is dad. I mean, you could just go on and on. And I just found this whole world opening up and thinking there were so many wonderful possibilities to this act of translation that I was really intrigued by it. And I loved the structure of language as well. I loved the way that you were learning a grammar and there was a structure and a rhythm to it. I used to pace up and down my bedroom at home, learning verbs, learning different tenses. And, you know, normally there were six parts, first, second, third, singular, first, second, third, plural, and you'd recite the the whole part, the whole conjugation of that verb. And I just really loved the, the rhythm, the movement, the structure, I think, uh, were things that really appealed to me. And I, I was doing French as well, and then started Greek when I was 13. And uh, I think that's that's when I started getting into it. But I, I know that you were a, a collector of dictionaries or something, and you liked, or phrase books, and you probably uh, maybe got into it earlier than I did, or you certainly liked to to collect different uh, books, is that right? That's true, yes. I uh, I still do. I still like collecting dictionaries of uh, different languages, uh, also mm. phrase books, because for some languages I have not been able to find an actual dictionary. Uh, yeah. But at least, you know, phrase books and also dictionaries. And it really has helped me in many ways because there are languages that once you know one language, you can get into another that's sort of similar. Like if you know some German, then the Scandinavian languages, uh, there are German. Germanic, of course, not Finnish, uh, are, are a lot easier. And so, you know, I am able to read texts in Swedish or in Norwegian uh, or in Danish uh, with the help of a dictionary simply because I know some German and the structure yeah. is very similar and the vocabulary in many ways is very similar. So that's the reason why uh, I used to do that. And I still do that. I still collect dictionaries of uh, different languages, many of which I will never learn and I will never speak, of course. Um <laughs> But I've always had that question in my mind. How many languages do you think you can speak really well? Because I sometimes hear mm -hmm. about people who maybe uh, say that they're fluent in 15 languages, let's say. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I always wonder, is it really possible to be fluent in so many languages? I, I, I always have the impression that two or three is more likely, or maybe four or five, if you're particularly talented. I, I don't know what you think about that. Do you think, to be really fluent, to, to, to be really inside a language, how many do you think you can actually learn? I think uh, I think you're right about that. When I hear people saying, you know, I can speak 20 languages fluently, I think, well, this person is either a genius or he's not really as good as he thinks he is uh, at, at some of those languages. Maybe he's communicative, but being fluent is a different thing. Um, yeah. I would say uh, at most three or four. In, in my case, yeah. I think I'm, I'm fluent in uh, Galician, Spanish, English, and I would say Portuguese uh, because, you know, French, uh, you know, I can speak French and I can be communicative in French, but I don't feel like I could do a podcast in French, for example, uh, yeah. without any notes. But I think I could probably do that in Portuguese. So I would say in my case, uh, four languages would be at this point my maximum. And I don't think I'm going to be uh, 
um, fluent in any more uh, in the re for the rest of my life. Uh, maybe I'll be able to read. Maybe I'll be able to be communicative. But that's a different matter. I think that's a very interesting question. What do you think? I, I would say the same. I think it's about about four, five maximum, and it helps a lot if you're learning them at an early age. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier about how I, I've heard that it's said that the, the throat of a human being forms more or less around the age of seven. And after that, you're more likely when learning a foreign language to have a foreign accent. But if you can start to speak it or pick it up before seven, you're likely to sound more, more like a native speaker. Uh, and I, I know that perhaps the memory works better at that time as well. So it's easier to learn vocabulary and to learn uh, different uh, conjugations and declensions and stuff like that. Uh, I suppose later on, Either the memory is not working so well, or we're becoming a little bit lazier. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, but still, I think even if you're not fluent, because then you've also got the question of whether you're able to practice the language every day. And if you're not, it's That's difficult right. to be fluent. Uh, even if you can just uh, communicate on a uh, on an intermediate level, I, I'm quite happy to be uh, at an intermediate level in in a couple of languages, and I, I'm. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that because at least you can still have a conversation even if it's not such an in-depth conversation. Uh, but I think uh, fluent, fluent, uh, I also would say three languages. And in relation uh, with that, Jonathan, uh, as someone who handles uh, several different languages, you've translated from Bulgarian, Catalan, Galician, uh, Spanish maybe. Um, do you think people who are multilingual uh, understand language and understand the world in a different way than people who only speak one language or two? It's a very interesting question and yes I do think it influences your vision of the world but, but what for me was most interesting is when I first came to Bulgaria uh, 14 years ago and I'd already been translating pretty much all the time because I didn't really stop after university. I carried on and, and, and took it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a job. Uh, I came to Bulgaria and obviously I needed to learn some Bulgarian. And what was interesting for me is at precisely that point when I was in a foreign environment, one that I wasn't familiar with at all, I knew very little about Bulgaria when I came. Uh, it was actually English that opened up to me. I had this very strong experience in the first six months that I was there, that I was here, that uh, all the language seemed to fall apart in front of my eyes and then be reconstructed. And I began to see that there was a whole level to the English language that I hadn't been aware of before that. Uh, I've written a couple of books about it, and I've got a third book coming out next year. Um, and it was all about what was under the surface of language and this for me was a very interesting experience we see the world around us we see you know landscape we see trees we see roads we we think we're all seeing the same uh, though i think we see different things at different times and i think even in the landscape around us there is another level and i think to language there is another level and this for me is very interesting but very little talked about um, so i found that when I came into a foreign environment like Bulgaria, when I arrived here 14 years ago, it was actually my home language that suddenly uh, opened itself to me. Uh, and it was a very, very shocking experience and a very absorbing experience. I was getting up at six o'clock every morning and uh, sitting for three hours, just uh, taking down what was being revealed to me because it seemed to me that there was a whole level of language I hadn't been aware of. And, and that was very interesting because we, we think of language like pretty much everything else as, as, as sort of dead matter that we use uh, as we wish. And I think we have to be very careful about that because maybe language is not dead uh, and uh, maybe it's not ours. And uh, like the environment that we should uh, protect and treat well. I think language is, is similar in a way, uh, that there is another level to it. And uh, you need to, we need to, as a race, I think, be, be open to that uh, possibility. But as I say, I think uh, we haven't got that far. And I think generally, when I speak to people about it, they either switch off, or they don't understand what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this will become more apparent as time goes by. But I don't think it's something that's being talked about. I don't think it's something that's being talked about in schools, in universities. Uh, and I think it's something that we need to be opening ourselves to. Uh, you may wonder what on earth I'm trying to say. I think there are threads in language and they connect. 
to, to give a very simple example, uh, if you want to listen to somebody, you have to be silent. Well, listen and silent have exactly the same letters. They're just rearranged. Or if you live, you have this choice between good and evil. This is something we've been brought up uh, with. Uh, well, if you turn the word live around, it spells evil. Mm -hmm. well, it's a very interesting coincidence that live, if you turn the letters around, spells the word evil. But it's also very interesting for me that if you take the I in live, which is the ego in English, we talk about I, that's the ego, mm -hmm. and you count, you count down, you take away the ego, and you go from one to zero. So you replace the I in live with zero, you treat it as a number, you've got love. So in the word live, you've two possibilities, one is to turn it around, and you've got evil. One is to take away the ego, and you've got love. Now that for me is very interesting, and that for me is language trying to teach us something, mm -hmm. trying to say something to us, and it's in front of our eyes. But I don't think we're aware of it. So I think we made the big mistake as a race, big, big mistake of thinking that we can see. And because, you know, when we're babies, we're blind for a very short period of time, not like some other animals, I think, that are blind and longer than us. We, we begin to see fairly soon. I think we think that once we've got our physical sight, that's it. You know, we're okay. I can see. Everything's great. And actually, that's physical sight, but there's spiritual sight, and that takes much longer. And for that, in my opinion, you need help. You can't do it on your own. You need your sight to be cleansed. And when that happens, uh, you begin to see things that you didn't realize were there. And that, for me, has in a way been the most interesting experience as a linguist. Mm -hmm. uh, apart, apart from the act of translation itself, which for me is wonderful, because you're constantly having to uh, follow a thread through a, through a labyrinth. Uh, and obviously, you know, once you've made your choice, you continue on that thread. You can't go back and change your choice and go somewhere else. That's it. You've made your choice. It's just like life. Uh, but there's also this other level to language. And, and I, I find it very interesting. But as I say, I think we are absolutely blind to it as, as a race. I think it's very little spoken about. And to be honest, I think people don't have that much interest. I think this will change, though, because uh, because I think language, in a, in a way, is trying to tell us something. Uh, but we have to be, we have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Your live uh, evil example brings to mind the moment when I realized that, which was through an album by Miles Davis from the 1970s, which is called Live Evil that is probably one of his most experimental albums up to that moment and I listened to it when I was about 12 and I hated the album and then many years <laughs> later I played it again and now it happens to be one of my favorite albums in the whole Miles Davis canon but uh, there, there, there's definitely something to that um, really uh, concise and clear example that you're given Jonathan and you know one thing I could say uh, trying to speak to that is that I don't think that I realize how little I knew of my own mother language, which is Spanish, um, until I actually stood in front of a classroom full of American students who didn't know any Spanish and had to teach it to them. And at that moment, that's when you realize many things about the language that you always spoke at home and at school and on the street, you realize many things that you had always taken for granted. And it's when you can actually take a step back uh, and, 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 and think of the language that you're using, uh, not only just as a tool that you know very well, but as something that you really don't know everything about, that you can really yeah. be aware that teaching a language is a very difficult thing. And uh, that's when you start thinking about how to teach it and what ways would be uh, easier or more effective. Um, and I think that's something that every uh, translator, of course, but also every language teacher has to think about. That's right. I, I think it's a very uh, steep learning curve. I remember having learned uh, Latin and Greek and French, uh, done classics at university, and then going to Lugo and starting to teach English. It was a very steep learning curve, as you say, to actually have to deal with my own language. It's almost, in a way, more comfortable to be dealing with a foreign language and then you just go 
back to your own language in in a comfortable situation where you're talking to people and stuff like that and and uh, you almost in a way feel more awkward when it, when you're dealing with your own language because suddenly you're you're faced with something that you thought was very familiar but you're having to discover how to teach it how to push it across in the best way and stuff like that so i i absolutely relate to what to what you're saying about that yeah I have a very yeah. good friend uh, in Spain who always uh, says that language is merely a technology for communication. Uh, do you agree with that or do you think that it goes beyond that, beyond being a technology for communication? I think it goes beyond that, but I think it is not an end in itself. Uh, so I think it's, uh, well, I say that, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it does go beyond that. Uh, I think, uh, it, but it depends really how how you're talking about it. I, I think there is a reality behind language. I, I'm not sure how well we understand language or how well I understand it myself. Uh, I'm a, a strong uh, uh, Orthodox Christian, uh, so a lot of my uh, uh, inspiration comes from uh, Christ. Uh, he is called the Word, uh, the Living Word. Uh, so, how does that, you know, tie in with our study of language, and why are theology and literature so far apart in, for example, in a university situation, in university faculties and stuff like that, when Christ is the Word? Now, if you accept that, maybe maybe you don't, but if you accept that, then surely there must be a, a connection between the two, between studying literature and studying theology. Uh, for example. And so I, 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 I wish in a way that we could be a little more, uh, we could broaden our horizons a little bit when it comes to 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 the study of language. It's not just a, an instrument, I don't think. Uh, I think it's a little bit more than that. And the other thing I would say is, uh, in the beginning when I was translating, um, I used to think it was all about activity, you know, it was about doing things. It was about my activity, my input, what I was doing, what I knew or didn't know. So I had lots of dictionaries which I used to lug about because I was always having to change accommodation because I was uh, so poor as a, working as a translator. And, uh, and then I came to realize some years on from that, that yes, there is a horizontal process of preparation of a text. You must know what words mean and if you have doubts, you need to consult the author or you need to check references on the internet and so on and so forth. But once you've done that horizontal act of preparation of the text, uh, I think it then becomes a question of listening, much more of listening. And for me now, when I'm actually sitting down to translate, I go into a process of listening and I'm trying to hear the translation because I don't know about your experience, but my experience is that when you are translating, there is a, a, a text, a voice that is coming. Now, where is it coming from? We think it comes from ourselves, of course, because we think we're authors, but I'm not so sure. Uh, so I, I very much hear a translation and then it becomes like a thread. And once you've got the thread and with a new author, that may take a couple of pages or, or whatever. But once you've got the thread, I think it's then just a question of holding on to it. And then a translation should be like an out breath. And you should just breathe out. And you should do that constantly for as long as it takes you to translate the book. And so when people say to me, well, isn't translating poetry more difficult than translating prose? I say, no, not at all. Because with a novel, especially if it's a long one, you've got to maintain that tension. You've got to keep hold of that thread for a much longer period of time. I translated Books Burn Badly by Manuel Rivas, one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. it took me 10 or 12 months to translate that book. That was quite a draining experience to keep the tension of the text going over such a long period of time. And so for me, the biggest step I took as a translator was to learn to listen. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something we could, we could all uh, benefit from in our, in our lives. Life is not activity. Yes, there is a certain amount of activity involved, but it's also listening. Uh, and uh, I think that's when uh, our lives become more difficult, but more enriching as well. Uh, I, I joke, and I will say it to you, I've never said this publicly, but I do believe it. Uh, I think if you reach a high enough, uh, this is probably where you'll end the interview. I think if you reach a high enough spiritual level, it is possible to translate without the text. <laughs>
Well, that's a very interesting idea in that uh, if you uh, translate without the text, one wonders what is it that you're translating? You're, you're catching hold of the thread. And I think the same thread that feeds the author when the author writes down the text, which is by no means perfect, by the way, we are not perfect. So what we do is not perfect. Uh, it can be pretty good, but I don't think it's necessarily perfect. And uh, people are, are wrong to think that the original is perfect and the translation is somehow inferior. I find plenty of mistakes in original texts and pre plenty of areas where I think maybe a sentence isn't stylistically as good as it could be. So uh, for me, the original text is also a translation. But there we are with what I was saying before about translators and authors. If you talk about the original text, you're saying it comes from the author and it starts with him or her. Uh, but I don't think that's the case. I think it comes through them. If it comes through them, if you accept that, that it comes through them and they put it down onto a piece of paper, drawing on all their life experiences and the things that they've read and the people they've spoken to, then you might accept that there is a thread on which they're drawing. Now, if you can catch the same thread in your own language, you might be able to do that without the original text. But don't you always need at least a certain uh, material reality to draw from when you're translating? I do. And, and every day when I sit down and I translate, I, I have the text in front of me and I'm working with the text and I'm translating what is in front of me. But I will say that there have been one or two moments, and they're very brief, where I've translated and I'm not sure I've looked at the text. And I think I've just caught the thread. And it lasts for a line or two, maybe three lines. And you, you've just caught the thread. Now, I'm very poor. If you could go on to another level, I think you could do that uh, more extensively. But it, it, I'm talking about something that is just in the back of my mind. It's not something I, I generally voice out loud. But uh, I think... It's very interesting. And if we start to think like that, we will start to see connections like the connections I mentioned earlier in the English language. We will start to see connections between what's happening around us. And we'll start to see that there are threads. We call them coincidence and we think they have nothing to do with each other. But actually they do. And, uh, and then, you know, I remember still uh, with translation having experiences where I'm translating a text and then I've gone outside or I've had a conversation or I've read an article in a newspaper and they're talking about the same thing. And I think, isn't that weird, you know? And people will say, well, that's the pregnant woman syndrome. You know, when, when your wife is pregnant or you yourself are a woman and you're pregnant, you start to notice lots of pregnant women, for example. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I had an extraordinary experience translating Lois Pereiro's poetry uh, when there was a poem to do with... Uh, Raymond Chandler, The Big Sleep, and in Galician that's called The Eternal Sleep. And mm -hmm. uh, I translated it, The Eternal Sleep, because that's what it said. And I kept being bugged about it, bugged about it, bugged about it. And I went uh, over the weekend. The book was already with the designer. I went down to Madrid. We had a meal in a restaurant. I went down to the restroom downstairs, and it was a huge poster of the Raymond Chandler film, The Big Sleep. And I realized I had to change it. I shouldn't be saying the eternal sleep as it is in Galician. I should be saying the big sleep. And I came, I was still a little unsure, if you can believe it. I came back to Santiago, where we were based at the time. I got on the train because I had to go down to Figo. And the girl next to me had a copy out of a library. She was reading Raymond Chandler, The Big Sleep. And at this point, I thought, OK, I... I give up, I accept I've made a mistake and I need to change this. And I immediately contacted the designer that evening. The book had been actually, uh, I think it had been at the printers already for a week. And unusually, they had not started printing. So it was like everything was on hold until I finally cottoned on to the fact that I shouldn't be writing The Eternal Sleep, but The Big Sleep. Now, those were things that had nothing to do with me sitting in a room with a computer. They're things that had to do with the outside world and they're things that, they're coincidences that came up in front of me to say to me something. And I think I always call coincidence the language of the spirit. It is language coming in front of you 
to say something. And we have to listen in one way or another. So coincidences that were not really coincidences in that case. Jonathan well, Dunn. Exa exactly coincidences, because they mean, coincidence just means things that happen together. But we understand them to be random, to be chaotic. But that's not what the word means. The word means happening together. And that's exactly what they are. You're listening to Jonathan Dunn here, the voice of Jonathan Dunn coming in, <coughs> joining us from Bulgaria on a new episode of The Written Page, episode number four. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, talking to you from Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America. Jonathan Dunn is a translator and a writer, and he's also the director and founder of Small Stations Press. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, that uh, venture. How did that project of Small Stations Press, which is now based out of Bulgaria, how did that come about? Well, uh, it's based out of Bulgaria primarily because it's a kind of venture that you wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to afford to do uh, with a family in England. But I wouldn't be able to, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be able to afford to translate literature with a family in England. Uh, you'll see that most people who translate literature are actually university teachers who do it uh, as a, as a sideline. And I think that's a shame because I think you need people who are translating full time. Uh, Small Stations was really because, well, it initially was, uh, I, uh, I wrote this book about language and, uh, and that's the first book we did, The DNA of the English Language. I thought it was a very important book to do. But behind that was the idea that not enough Galithian literature was being translated. I've got in front of me the list of Galithian books. Let's bear in mind that the Galithian language is the second minority language in Europe. Minority meaning without a state. Uh, so let's not not Portuguese or not not Spanish because they have a state. Uh, the second minority language in Europe, with about let's say three million to six million, depending on who you're talking to, speakers. That's a lot of people, and it's a very rich culture with a very rich literary heritage uh, and some fantastic authors. Uh, now, I felt that not enough literature was coming out of Galicia. And this was of concern to me because this is my work and Galician is a language I feel intimately connected with. Uh, between the first book translated from Galician was in 1964. Between 1964 and 2008, uh, just before we started publishing Galician literature in English, there were 29 books of Galician literature published. In the last 10 years, there have been 66 and we've done 41 of them. So there's been, you know, uh, a huge uh, exponential growth. Uh, and I felt that was very important to be bringing out more authors. Do you, do you know that the, the most famous Galician author, I think for me the most international is Manuel Rivas, but mm -hmm. the most famous is probably Rosalia de Castro. Her first uh, complete poetry book in English was published by us, Galician Songs, in 2013, 150 years after it was first published. Now, I think that's almost shameful that such a well-known book, such an emblematic book for Galician people, and they are one of the peoples of Europe, are we so short-sighted or so poor or so stingy that we can't afford to produce a book like that in the languages of Europe? And yet you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to do. And what financial commitments I had to make as not a rich individual to see that that book came out. Uh, you, you often have to put money forward, which you hope to get back later from grants and institutional support from the Galician government, the Junta de Galicia, and so on. But up front, you're the one putting the money uh, on the line. When I started 10 years ago, I had savings of 10,000 euros. My savings now are 140 euros. That's, that's, those are my savings. Uh, so that gives you some indication of the commitment involved. But I think it's important work. Uh, and I think little by little, people are cottoning onto it. And I notice in the sales of our books that they are steadily increasing. Uh, it takes time. You can't change things overnight. But they are steadily increasing. And I think as people read one title, they will be drawn to another. What is frightening for me is the total lack of attention 
in national media given to translated literature, aside from household names like Isabel Allende or mm -hmm. Orhan Pamuk. Total lack of interest. Nobody contacts me to say, what interesting authors do you, do you have? I, I'm the main publisher of Galician Literature in English. Galician Literature is one of the main European languages, and English is the world language of communication. So why aren't, why isn't, why aren't uh, national journalists contacting me to say, what can I review next week? Quite the contrary. I had a conversation with Eileen Battersby from the Irish Times, who said to me that her, she was always running a risk when she reviewed translated titles because her editors were not happy with her. They wanted to be on safer ground. Now, that's very worrying because it means that readers are being conditioned as to what they read. They will only read what comes up on the first page of Amazon or what's in the weekend papers. And I think uh, reviewers are very limited in what they're reviewing. Yes, they are sometimes beginning to, to look further afield, but not very much further afield. And uh, I think that's very important. Uh, for people to become aware of the offer. And that, for me, is the great challenge facing Galician literature at the moment. We've increased the number of titles, but we need to promote them. There needs to be a concerted effort to promote them with institutional support, because I can't do it uh, on my own. I'm the only Galician speaker speaking English editor, uh, as far as I know. And... Uh, uh, there needs to be a concerted effort. I, I've been trying for, for, for some time now to, to um, start an office of translation so that we can begin to, to make a concerted effort to get Galician titles into schools, into university libraries, into the local public library and uh, into bookshops and to organise events and so on and so forth because uh, there isn't an institute that does that. And even if there is like the Cervantes Institute on the national level, on the Spanish level, I wrote to the cultural uh, representative in London of the Cervantes Institute and I wrote to the director. Neither of them replied to my email. That was a couple of years ago saying that we were the main publisher of Galician Literature in English. Uh, why not? Or why weren't they contacting me first? So I think uh, we have a long way to go and a lot of work to do, and I hope that will be carried on by the new generation coming coming after me and after other people like Erin Moore and John Rutherford and Kathleen March and Karis Evans and all these people who've been doing amazing work. I know, for example, next year, uh, some of the younger translators, Scott Shanahan, Jacob Rogers, uh, are planning uh, issues with uh, Words Without Borders and uh, Asymptote. How do you pronounce that, the online magazine? Uh, I'm not sure. I would say uh, asymptote, maybe. <laughs> I'm okay. not sure. But maybe there's I, I, a difference between something. the American pronunciation and the British pronunciation of a word that is hardly ever used. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Both of them are planning uh, Galician dedicated issues next year, as I understand. Uh, so that's very positive. Uh, but I think uh, uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of work still to do. It's not just about getting stuff translated it's also about um, editing it and promoting it and 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 so on and so forth you know when i edit a title it takes me a week to do i don't get paid for that work so basically i'm putting a week out you know aside to do it uh, uh it's very important because you can't just take a translation and make it into a book you've got to have an editing process in the middle uh and then you've got to have a a, a promotional process after after that and i, th I think there's there's still a lot of work to do. The fact that we're approaching 100 titles of Galician literature in English is, is good. But if I'm honest with you, I think it should be 300 or 500. Well, I think what, you know the work that uh, Small Stations is doing in promoting uh, and translating and presenting and offering uh, Galician literature in the English language is, is fantastic. And that is one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you as a guest on the show today. Uh, the problem seems to be one of visibility, where you have um, a, a market that is flooded by pretty much the same titles by the same writers over and over again, probably because of the financial groups that are behind all of this. And then you're trying to do something different and something that is uh, necessary from my point of view. And it's very difficult. It's very expensive. And, uh, you know, based on 
the um, numbers that you were given uh, before, uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, to really call small stations a business venture because it's more of a cultural venture. You're doing it because you believe in the value of the literature and the culture that you're translating. And I think, you know, I'm really attracted by that, but I think that it is very important to give it as much visibility as possible. How to do that, I don't know. And I'm aware of the difficulties of doing that from what you're telling me. Um, which is really too bad. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about when I was looking at the different uh, collections and the different series that uh, Small Stations is publishing now uh, of Galician literature um, titles, uh, what is it that you bear in mind when you select Galician texts to translate, Jonathan? Well, it will either be uh, uh, my, own, my own personal taste or it will be the the taste of other literary translators that we're working with, um, or I have uh, a couple of people in Galicia that I, whose judgment I trust, uh, Dolores Bilavedra, who's a, uh, a professor of Galician literature at Santiago University, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man Manuel Bragado, who used to be the director of one of the main Galician publishing houses, Shed Eyes, mm -hmm. and, and one or two other people that I'm uh, frequently in contact with and asking them, because I can't read everything uh, I, and I can't you know I think in a with a venture like this it's much better to rely on multiple opinions and not only on your own so I try to spread the net as uh, uh, as wide as possible uh, also I did uh, uh, a two-volume bilingual anthology of Galician literature uh, a few years back it came out uh, in, in in two volumes the history of Galician literature was the first and then contemporary Galician literature was the second that also gave me uh, exposure to a, lot, to a lot of authors. But I'm always learning because since they came out, there are new authors. You know, we recently did, for example, a young adult fiction title by Antonio Manuel Fraga mm -hmm. called Tartarus. It's a really great book. It's a really lovely book. Uh, now, he's more recent than my anthology. So you're constantly uh, learning learning new authors. I'm constantly trying to keep an eye on the uh, literary prizes in Galicia. Uh, see who's winning, you know, the main fiction prizes and 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 so on. Uh, but as I say, it's not just me; it's uh, other translators as well. And they're, you know, they'll say, "I want to do this book," or "I think this is a really good book to do," and that's great. You know, I'm really happy to take that on board, uh, so that first of all, translators are working with literature that they like, and secondly, so that it's not just my opinion. Uh, I I deliberately put the titles into different uh, series so that uh, people can identify what they're what they're looking for so we have poetry we have young adult fiction we have uh which is called galician wave and we have uh, adult fiction which is small stations fiction uh, and uh so that you should be able to identify pretty quickly where where you want to go i'm, I'm particularly keen on the young adult fiction i think uh Galithian Literature has great uh, young adult fiction writers and great illustrators I, i'm really impressed mm -hmm. by the artistic level of the illustrations, and they're so charming and uh, uh, and captivating that it's also something I really enjoy when we had the opportunity to include uh, illustrations. We, we we did a couple of uh, illustrated books, uh, uh, Agustin Fernandez Path mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Xavier do Campo. They, they both came out with color illustrations, and then sometimes we have black and white illustrations. So that's a really lovely, lovely thing as well. But I also have this idea that if you can, because I'm a great believer in telling stories and the joy of reading a good story, because I still think people mostly want to read a good story. They're not so interested in technique and how you tell the story. I think they just mm -hmm. want a good story, you know, especially younger readers and, and also adults when they've been working all day and they're a little bit tired and they just want to relax with a book. Uh, I, I think people just still really enjoy a good story. And I love young adult fiction because it just focuses on telling a good story with doses of humor and doses of poetry and, and, uh, and stuff like that. And I, I think there, there's a, a very talented bunch of Galician writers writing young adult fiction. Uh, and I've been trying to uh, focus on on them a, uh, a great deal uh, over the over the last few years, but of course we do we do adult fiction as well, uh, some poetry titles. I would say for prose, we're pretty much the only publisher of Galician literature in English. Uh, poetry, there are several, including us, 
Uh, and I think that's that's pretty much how the situation, and essay there are uh, a couple as well. That's pretty much the, the situation at the moment. I hope that uh, uh, some other publishers will, will begin to take on prose titles, and I hope with some of the younger translators that are coming to the fore now, I mentioned Scott Shanahan and Jacob Rogers, because I know that they're active at the moment and contacting publishers in the States about bringing out uh, some new uh, prose titles, that they'll be other publishers, not only us, but I think pretty much at the moment for prose fiction, you're talking small stations. I totally agree with you, Jonathan, that uh, uh, at least since the uh, early to mid '90s, uh, the, um, the 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 young adult fiction written in Galician has really exploded, and there's a lot of really good authors, uh, a lot of um, good quality works that have come out there. Some of which have actually won the national prize in Spain. Um, are you ever in contact with the authors when you translate one of these texts? Do you find that useful at all? Absolutely. I'm, I'm always in touch with them. First of all, to get the rights, uh, if it's a book that we're publishing. And, uh, and then, uh, as I say, through, mostly through the preparatory process when I'm preparing the text for translation. And then I may have one or two queries as I'm, as I'm going through, but mostly before uh, translating the book. But it's very lovely because I... Uh, I form uh, very, very good friendships with them uh, and we have lovely communication and I get to know a little bit about the context of how the book was written, when the book was written and, and it's very encouraging. Uh, it's one of the nicest things about working with Galician literature is the relationship with authors, other translators and uh, publishers, Galaxia and Sherais in particular because they're the two main Galician publishing houses for literature. and. I have a very good relationship with both of them, and I'm very grateful for that because you also need to have the the uh, human contact, you know, not to be uh, completely isolated, so that you're, you know, there's a group of you working, uh, uh, and that's very nice. But the authors are definitely are definitely a part of that, and uh, and a very uh, rewarding part because they're generally very grateful, and they generally are very keen to see their work translated into English, and I think. Uh, that, generally speaking, uh, their books are very good uh, and they deserve to be translated into English. And, you know, um, going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's it's a drop in the ocean in terms of finance uh, to to see that regularly the, the, the best books from different cultures I work with in the context of Europe. But, of course, there's Asia, there's Africa, there's uh, Latin America. Uh, the, to see that books are being are being translated. But I think institutions have to play their role. Uh, I often mention the European Union in this context. Uh, I never apply to the European Union for a translation grant, even though they have quite a large budget, I think, because they limit translation costs to 50% of the project. Mm. Now, if you have any experience of publishing, you will know that the translation is the main cost. If you're going to put yourself the same money that the translation costs into the project, you're going to lose a lot of money. So uh, it, to put a limit, which is such a arbitrary limit of, you know, 50%, and then they're basically saying, we want to see that you're putting the same amount of money that we are, is very unrealistic. And it's, it's done by, for me, a bureaucrat sitting in Brussels who doesn't have experience or hasn't spoken to publishers. And, and this is what worries me. I think in many ways... The people who make money out of translation are the ones who talk about it, but the ones who actually do it don't. Uh, we are kidding ourselves if we say that translation is a profession. It is not a profession. Uh, you get by. And what happens the day you stop translating, for whatever reason, I don't know. <laughs> but you're not going to have uh, much of a pension. and. Uh, you're not going to have much else besides. And so, uh, and this for me is a, a very poor reflection on our society. I think there were older societies where translation was much more valued uh, than it is today. And uh, we've got swept up into something. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, there's a lot of conflict there, a lot of distrust. Uh, it's not translation because translation doesn't engender distrust. It does the opposite. And uh, if translators are being squeezed more and more, which they are, I can tell you from personal experience, 
Yeah, it's not not a good thing. You know, I, I'm always in a bit of a quandary when younger translators seek my advice and about entering translation as a career. And I, I say to them, well, you, it's risky and you probably need to have something alongside it or, forgive me for saying this, be married to somebody who has a more normal job because uh, then you might be able to manage it. Because if, if you're the main breadwinner, uh, then I think it's going to be complicated for you. Uh, it's a wonderful practice, and I think it's very enriching for everyone involved. Uh, but we don't live in a society that favours translation, and I think that should make us all pause to wonder why. It sort of reminds me, you know, this that you're talking about, Jonathan, of uh, something that I have talked to about um, to uh, several uh, jazz musicians on my Jazz Flashes podcast, which is another series I do on this channel. Uh, and a lot of them, uh, you know, love playing uh, live uh, jazz, but they know that playing live jazz, there's really not much money in that. So they have to supplement that by teaching at a high school or teaching at a college or something like that. So um, it's sort of like a similar um, situation, as though playing music or translating could not be uh, an economically sound pursuit uh, by itself. And because it isn't, because of the way society is built and because of the way um, uh, things actually work in reality, then you have to do something else besides the translation or besides the, 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 the playing of music. That's right. That's right. But uh, but it, it worries me that because uh, I know that a lot of people they get by, as I said earlier, by uh, teaching at university, for example, and then translating maybe a book or something. But I think you really need translators who are full time because you go much deeper into translation when you're doing it day by day. And I think it's really important to have people like that who are dedicated. It's only a handful of people. Uh, who are dedicated to translation every day, because then you're going to get a, a much richer understanding of translation. You know, translation is taught in universities, often by people who are not practitioners. And mm -hmm. for me, they may not even have translated a book. And for me, uh, you've got to practice translation. Translation is an experience. You can talk about it as much as you like, but it's an experience. You've got to experience it. Uh, I could say the, 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 the same about other things. I, I spent one year in a university uh, uh, in translation studies, and I'd already been translating for 20 years, uh, uh, professionally for, for maybe 10, and, but I include my school years because I was translating at that time. And I couldn't understand uh, the language that was being used to describe translation studies. And I was a practitioner of translation. Translation is something that I've loved all, all my life. Um, but it was put into uh, a foreign language so that I couldn't actually understand what people were talking about. What is this that translation in an academic environment is put into a language that you can't understand? Uh, that sort of almost goes against the whole meaning of, of translation. And this is why I maintain that translation should be kept out of universities by people who are doing it every day, because it is a practice. It's not an academic subject, even if you choose to study it, and maybe you will gain some experience and you will learn some interesting things, but you've got to do it. And I think you need in a healthy society to have people who are doing it uh, on a regular basis and not just you know, when they've got a little bit of spare time or they've retired from their other job. Because that's really putting translation on the margins. And translation is, is not marginal or life is marginal. And I begin to think that maybe life is marginal. That actually, once you begin to see through all the clutter that's put in front of our eyes every day, uh, you begin to see that the real stuff is on the margins. And maybe that's why translation is on the margins. And I because it, it is real. And I couldn't agree more with what you're saying, Jonathan, but it, it, it leads me to think uh, that perhaps what you're describing, and that uh, is exact. I can see myself reflected in that in so many ways because um, when I was uh, at the University of Vigo and I wanted to well, you know, go for a major, uh, as we say here in America, even though, as you know, in Spain, that idea of major and minor doesn't really exist, at least not in my time. 
Uh, but when I was trying to uh, to choose a major and I was thinking about translation and interpreting, uh, either that or uh, English philology, uh, becoming an English major, and I decided the latter, I decided to do philology because I could see that in, in translation and interpretation, there was in interpreting, there was very little uh, about literature. Not a lot of literature was was. Uh, studied maybe because uh, whoever was running the program and whoever had designed the program did not think that there was much money in translating literature. But uh, my interest was literature, and that was what decided me, what what made me decide to become um, an, an an English major and not a translation major. Yeah, but I think uh, Jonathan that I, that, I, that says just... a lot more about. Uh, academia, really, the way academia works works or doesn't work than translation itself. Yeah. I've spoken to Spanish translators um, who say that they just have to speed through books to make a living and that they're, they're pretty much going to burn out. And I can really uh, empathize with that because you know, you you also need a break from time to time and you, you need to, to take a little distance and come back to it. And if you're being forced to, to just keep going page after page after page just to make a living from it, you are eventually going to burn out. And I think it's just a question of people knowing about it and hearing about it and beginning to uh, be open about it. Because whenever I've had conversations with people, for example, if you're in, I've been in London on several occasions and had uh, conversations with people that I've not met before and we've talked about translation. And when you talk about it and they become aware that there is a person involved in the process of translation, they're very open to the idea. They actually like the idea a lot. And I think if more people became aware of it, they there would be greater demand. And then that would, you know, uh, work to Im to improve the situation, but I I think the, the the biggest problem is that people are not aware of it. They think that books in English are already available in English, and there's no one else uh, involved. Uh, I always think about the situation when you know when you're in a foreign language environment in an uh, of a foreign language that you don't know, how at a loss you feel until somebody enlightens you and puts what's being said into a language that you can understand. So in that moment, you're absolutely in need of translation. Or imagine a war situation where two sides meet and they have to have an interpreter there to translate for them. Vital. But as soon as that moment passes, I think everybody forgets about it again. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it's a bit like doing back exercises if you have a bad back. You know, when you've got the pain, the pain's terrible and you're absolutely forced to do 20 minutes back exercises. But when the pain's gone, you forget about it again and you get on with your ordinary life. Now, I'm not saying, though for me, as I said earlier, translation is everything. Translation is life. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, it should be top of the agenda, though I wouldn't mind. But I think it could, it should go higher up the agenda. And as I say, it's comparative to other things, relative to other things. It's extremely cheap to maintain a group of translators who are working day in, day out on uh, exchanging cultural values, stories, understanding between different languages, especially those who are working into English, of course, because uh, that's a language that many people can read, but also other languages as well. It's extremely cheap to do if you compare it with some of the other stuff that gets uh, a budget. Uh, so really, for me, there's, there's, there's no excuse. Uh, but it's a question of uh, policy and and of vision in many ways. And uh, until people begin to see it as something important and begin to see it as something that involves them on a personal level, because they themselves are in some way a translator. I remember there was this big hoo-ha when a book came out. Uh, the translator as writer. And it was like the translator was being given the pedestal they deserved. And I thought, that's rubbish. It's the writer as translator. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's not that translation is a small part of writing. Writing is a small part of translation because everything we do is translation. And I think the act of writing is also translation. Writers, when they write a book on a blank piece of paper without another text next to them, they are also drawing on experiences, on things they've read, on people they've spoken to. Uh, it's very difficult to write a book about something you know nothing about. So 
they also, in a sense, are translating. And they also are hearing a voice that they're putting on a piece of paper. Now, where that voice is coming from, I don't know. Most people will say it's coming from them, from their mind. Okay, if you accept that. But I know that there are people who write books in six days, and it's like the, the book has just come to them in a thread. Well, again, is it from them, their mind? Maybe if you think we're all isolated individuals with lines drawn around us, so we're countable nouns, you will think, okay, yes, it's come from me, and it started with me, but I don't believe that because I don't believe in countable nouns, particularly. Uh, I think there are connections between all of us, and, uh, uh, and, and that's where uh, writing is, uh, is an act of translation, because, because you're, you're drawing on your context, your history, uh, and your own personal experience. And when you write the book, or if you write the book again a year later, you will write it in a different way, uh, so it, it shows that you're drawing on different experiences and different uh, at a different time. I think uh, a translation can never be the same again. And that goes back to your idea that uh, translation is life and life uh, is translation. But latching on to what you uh, said, do you think that sharing translated texts into English, for example, with other people actually encourages their interest in other languages and cultures? Or do you think that people tend to take for granted that bridge between languages that the translators provide? I don't know. I know I, I generally I don't think if people come across a translated text they're they're going to set out the next morning to learn to learn that language. I, I think they accept it uh, as an invitation in into the lives of another culture, into the life of another culture, and they they enjoy that experience. Like when we travel, you know, um, we were in Istanbul last week, very very near to Bulgaria, uh, very interesting experience. But you know, I'm not going to now go and live in Istanbul or or learn Turkish. Uh, but I was very grateful for the experience, and I was enriched by the experience of being in that city. Uh, and I think it's the same with, with translation. It's a, it's a, it's a, for the person reading the book, I think it's a bit like travel. You're, you're being exposed but to that culture for a period of time through the translation, but probably the next day you're going to be getting on with your life uh, unless your, your job uh, demands that you learn uh, a foreign language, but that will not be because of the translated text. Uh, so, no, I think translation brings the, the text to you. Uh, I suppose some people may become so absorbed. Uh, you could take the example of the New Testament. You know, if you're a strong believer, you may one day want to read the, the Greek, right? But then, you know, we understand that New Testament was written in ancient Greek and all New Testament Greek, uh, which is easier than ancient Greek. Uh, but uh, as my understanding is that the Gospel of Matthew is actually uh, possibly a translation itself uh, from Hebrew. So even then, the original language is not the original language. So we're never quite sure what the original language is. Uh, I think it's always the product of a, uh, a space and time conjunction. Someone in a particular place at a particular time who writes down his or her experience and how they remember things. And what for me is very interesting is to what extent is that the product of that person or to what extent are they serving as a channel through which that experience is being written down. You're listening to a new episode of The Written Page here on the Anton GF YouTube channel. Our guest today is Jonathan Dunn, author and translator and also the uh, director of Small Station Express. He's joining us from his home in Bulgaria. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez and... Uh, you're uh, listening on YouTube uh, right now, and uh, I appreciate your listening. And now, um, as we're winding down our uh, conversation, I have a few more things that I would like to ask you about, uh, Jonathan, regarding your Galician translations that um, are available from anywhere you get uh, books. I get mine from Amazon, for example, and that's how I got a lot of these translations uh, on Small Station Press. Uh, as you delve into uh, the Galician language and translating texts, uh, novels and poetry in Galician, are there uh, any elements of Galician literature that uh, you think are particular to Galician literature and that you have not found in other literary traditions that you know? <laughs> 
Uh, it's difficult for me to say because I work mainly with, with Gallifian literature. So mm -hmm. uh, that I don't necessarily uh, have such a large experience outside Gallifian literature. I have translated from Catalan, from Spanish, and uh, and also from Bulgarian. Um, I think there is a, a very nice sense of humour, and I think uh, texts can be very poetic. Uh, you think of someone like Manuel Rivas. Uh, and there can be certain elements of Galician culture. But no, I think uh, there is, uh, you know, something that's uh, common and shared by, by uh, which is part of the, the human experience. And, and we were talking earlier about, you know, uh, telling a story and uh, people always enjoy a story. And I think that will be true of, uh, of any culture or, or, or any text that you translate. Obviously, the context may be different. You know, there are a lot of books of Galician literature that are involved with the Spanish Civil War. Uh, so that's a, a particular experience of, of that uh, geographical area. Though I was very pleased when Leticia Costas brought out her book, An Animal Called Mist, mm -hmm. that she'd written a book of short stories based uh, in and around the context of the Second World War and not the Spanish Civil War, because uh, I think it's, it's good also to explore further afield and not only to write about uh, the Spanish Civil War, because that's the, the one that affected uh, your culture most closely. And I was very impressed by her because she she wrote this book with six short stories that are very uh, shocking, and they they really stay with you when you when you've when you've read them. And I thought she'd she'd obviously really researched that and uh, gone into it and uh, to put herself in the mind of the characters. Uh, so uh, I thought that was very good. Ledita Costas for me is a very strong writer of the of the younger generation coming through, uh, along with some others. Um, so I think there are there is a context and, of course, a language in which the, the stories are being written down, and they may have particular elements that are, uh, uh, you know, they may refer to a dance or food or uh, a place, uh, uh, or they may evoke the famous nostalgia or Mourinho or, mm -hmm. or they may have the lovely sense of, of humour that they're this uh, slight uh, retranca or irony that there may be uh, in Galithian literature but, but I think there is something common to us all otherwise I, I wouldn't uh, bother translating it I agree that there's an incredible uh, versatility to uh, Leditia Costas as a, as a writer, and I think that's one of the reasons why she has become so popular in the uh, last few years, although that novel, mm -hmm. uh, that collection of short stories that you're talking about, they had been published quite a while back, and that might be one of her very first books, but uh, it's uh, it's an author that definitely uh, has uh, gotten a lot of attention, and, and, and totally deservedly so, in my uh, opinion. Um, have you found any concepts uh, or ideas in Galician literature that have been difficult for you to translate, to transpose into English? Well, I mean, we mentioned we mentioned just now the idea of uh, 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 the Galician context and, and things like dances or food or, or places and stuff like that. And I think, uh, what do you do, for example, if you're presented with Muñeira, this uh, Galician dance? Mm -hmm. um, I think now that we live in the age of the internet and Google and things like that, it's so easy for people to type in Muñeira and they probably will get a YouTube video that will show them exactly what it is and they can actually see it, mm -hmm. that our role as translators is changing a little bit. Whereas in the past, you, you might have needed to put a footnote, though I hate footnotes in works of fiction. I think you need to maintain the story and not uh, turn it into an academic text. But uh, you know, in the past, you might have needed to do that to explain what it is. Or uh, the trick I use, which I'm sure a lot of translators use, is just to put in a little word, uh, you know, like the dance, the muñeira, instead of just muñeira, mm -hmm. so that people, the reader understands it's a dance. Uh, you can always do that with just a couple of words, and the reader won't even notice that you're doing it. Uh, but there's so much information now, uh, and we're privileged in that sense that we can find out about it that I think even things that are particular to Galician culture can be viewed uh, online and uh, a lot more is available to find out about it. Uh, so uh, that changes, I think, uh, the, 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 the work of the translator. I think his, his work is, his, or her work is much more to, to transpose the text and to retell uh, the story 
you you have mentioned that uh, within Galician literature, there's um, a lot of humor. There's there's a certain kind of humor. Uh, how do you uh, handle the translation of humor? Maybe the kind of humor that you find in Galician texts might be different from the kind of humor that maybe English readers would be used to or expecting. Uh, how do you go about translating those humorous texts into English? Well, that's where I'm very lucky, because I think the English share the Galician sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I think we also have a similar sense of humor. So for me, it's very easy. I just apply the English sense of humor, uh, and it more or less comes out. Uh, but what for me is another question that I think we haven't quite touched on yet, is this idea that if you're doing a translation, should you be translating every word exactly as it is? Mm -hmm. And should the adjective that's in the Galician text be the same adjective that it is in English? And I think there are some people that are very uptight about these things. And if they come across an adjective that's been translated differently, they're going to say the translator has made a mistake mm -hmm. or this is a bad translation. And they're not understanding that translation is a thread and you're telling a story and you can't break the thread. And maybe at that point, at that point in, in time, uh, a different adjective is going to work better in the English to tell the story. And you've got to have fluidity. Uh, you've got to allow that. You know, I, I uh, came across a phrase the, the other day uh, where it said, no problem, baby. And I put, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it was written, no problem, baby, in English, in the original text. But I thought it didn't sound right. It wasn't going to, it would stand out. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I thought it was better to keep the thread. So I went with the English. I just let it flow. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to me, I'm allowed to do that. But I'm sure, and let's face it, in 95% of the cases, you are putting the same. But I think you've got to allow that uh, versatility and you've got to allow the translator to retell the story. And if you're worried about every single word being the same, you don't understand translation. I totally agree. And um, one thing that comes to mind uh, when, when you mention that, the idea of being faithful to the original, you know, as though it were an immovable thing and it could never be changed. A little bit uh, the way that some people look at uh, um, uh, constitutions in some parts of Europe. <laughs> I, my question would be, do you think the uh, author, uh, I'm sorry, the translator always adds a little something to the text that he or she is translating. Yes, I do, absolutely. They're, they're adding all the time. They're, there's a lot of input. You know, I find that when I'm when I finish translating for a day, uh, I can be quite weary. I can be, because you've given a lot of yourself, I, I think that's what's involved in the process, but you receive a lot as well. Uh, so for me, absolutely. Uh, I think translations are on a par with the with the original if they're done well uh, they can even be better maybe I don't know but uh, uh, I think they if they're recreations if you're retelling the story uh, they should be a product of their own space time conjunction uh, so they're not a repeat because they can't be you can't go back in time and repeat the moment when the author sat down and wrote that book and sit in their chair uh, it's not going to work. You can't do it. So you've got to, to recreate it. Uh, and it will be a different experience. It doesn't mean it's going to be a worse one. Uh, and I think uh, you're relying a lot on the voice of the translator at this point, because that's what you're going to hear. Uh, you may beware, be aware of something that's under the text or behind the text. Uh, but generally speaking, you're hearing it through the voice of the translator, like when you're in a room listening to an interpreter, what you're hearing is the voice of the interpreter. So political leaders, they're hearing the voice of the interpreter. They're not, if they don't speak the language, they're not hearing the voice of the other politician. And I suppose that's the only time when translation becomes, uh, you know, when you're dealing with legalistic texts, maybe then you have to be much more careful with that particular particular word because can you imagine if you created some kind of conflict by not using the right word it would be awful <laughs> uh, but you know people talk about the bible as you know the word of god and yes it is the word of god but the word of god is is fluid uh it's it, it moves it, it, it it's in our lives uh and i think 
think, you know, you have to allow for that. I don't think it's an immovable thing. Um, I was writing a text today about pilgrimage, and uh, there is a sense, you know, that from one point of view, if you want to bear fruit in this life, you've got to stay in one place. If you keep moving about, you won't bear fruit. But from another point, if you stay still, you become stagnant. So there has to be a kind of balance between those. And I thought pilgrimage was a wonderful balance because in a pilgrimage where you're putting one foot in front of another, you are both staying in one place because you're constant, you keep doing it, and you're moving, you're going from one place to another. And I think that's that's what human life is. So I repeat what I say, that uh, translation is life and life is translation. That brings to mind the famous quote from Jorge Luis Borges where he who was always poking fun at the readers, always having a great time at the expense of the reader, I think, uh, said famously, really, that uh, he would rather read Don Quixote in English than in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> and some people find that to be elitist, but in a way I think he's talking about something similar or getting at some similar uh, point as, as you are trying to. Whatever works for you. Uh, why, why, why not? Why, why should he not prefer uh, to read it in English. Uh, and there are so many wonderful translations recently of, uh, of that book. Uh, Edith Grossman, I think, did one. John oh, Rutherford yeah. as well. Uh, it's so lovely that uh, a book written so long ago still inspires uh, so many different people to work with it and to give their own interpretation. But we have to be careful because, you know, interpretation is fine to a point, but I don't think you should go outside uh, the boundaries. So, you know, you have to find a happy medium. So you mean that uh, when you interpret something, you have to be careful not to lose sight of the text? Yes, you mustn't let it run away with you. Uh, but uh, nor should it be set in stone. I totally agree with that again because, uh, and by the way, the Edith Grossman translation that you're talking about is the one that I always use whenever I teach uh, Don Quixote in English uh, in my uh, honors classes simply because I think it's a very accessible for the students, a very modern sort of translation. But I do agree with that idea. One should not, one should, one should have, of course, a critical eye when, uh, when, when facing a text and when interpreting a text. But I feel uh, like, like more and more, especially with the influence of uh, postmodernism and, and cultural studies and that, that, those sorts of trends, sometimes we tend to use the text as just an excuse to write about how we feel about the text or, 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 or things that are somehow uh, related to the text but not so much. And uh, we sometimes, I think, as critics, uh, lose sight of what the actual text is about, and there are certain things that simply are not there. And we are just maybe putting them there uh, without really bearing in mind that, you know, the, the, the text is the main reason why we're doing the criticism. Yes, yes, but I, I, I suppose also, in a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in a university environment, but I suppose also in a university environment you've got to go, go beyond the text in the sense that it's not uh, an isolated product. It's not written in, in an isolated situation. And the people you're teaching and the students who are studying that text have also got to go outside and or leave university after a number of years. And it's very important for me that they know how to do that. And I think when I left school, when I left university, I was a little bit stranded. I, I, I really didn't know what to do or how to do it and uh, because I think my learning had been so in so isolated in a way in such a an isolated environment and I think we have a duty if we're to you know consider ourselves a, a worthy generation we have a duty to uh, to ease that process whereby young people who are can be very uh, you know easily influenced know how to take the next stage and so when you're analysing a text or you're, you're, you're looking at a text, it is also about the individual's response to that text and teaching them uh, or learning with them or learning from them uh, how to behave and how to apply the knowledge. Because I, I still 
you forgive me for saying this, but my four years at university were the most sterile years of my life. I'm not really in, in, in disagreement with that. And I, I actually, in, 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 ma in many ways, uh, uh, Jonathan, I see myself uh, uh, sort of, I recognize myself in those words. Yeah, I, I learned far more from coming into contact with uh, foreign cultures, you know, and now in Bulgaria uh, than I ever did from, you know, from uh, an academic or learning environment. And I think there's a great danger that we put universities up there as centers of learning uh, and think of them as almost the only centers of learning. And I think very often in an academic environment, people are very narrow in their approach. They've specialized in one very small area. I sometimes look at conferences and see the list of papers that are being given and they're so specialized you know and and i think it is this helping so that with translation studies there they're written in a language that is either extremely dull or barely comprehensible and is this is this learning i i don't that's not my experience of learning my experience of learning came from other environments and other places uh, travel uh, uh, my own reading you know, people that you meet and, and so on. And uh, it worries me sometimes that universities seem to have a, a, a little bit of a hold on on uh, the concept of learning as if they're the only place you're going to do it. And uh, I don't think that's the case. I think people have recognised that through the years uh, and have seen learning as something that happens outside. Uh, but but I, I think we're still very limited by that. And even though I am a college professor, maybe because I am a college professor, I, I, I can see that. I can see that your, your, your point about learning outside of the university being incredibly valuable and, and, and the university not being the only place of knowledge uh, par excellence. You know, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right about that. And I, I, I think about that pretty much every day, Jonathan. Yes. Now, uh, there's a book that you've written called The Life of a Translator. And uh, unfortunately, Jonathan, I haven't had the chance to read this book uh, yet. It's on my reading list. I'd like to read it at some point. I, I think the title uh, already promises something very interesting. Could you uh, speak briefly about what uh, that book is about? It's, it's actually a, a more succinct version of uh, The DNA of the English Language, my first book. Uh, but it also deals with coincidence in translation. I talked about that earlier with the example of uh, Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. That, that's coincidence in translation where the text you're working on uh, connects with things that are going on around you. The life of a translator, I think people would understand to mean the kind of life that I or someone else like me leads. Actually, it's not. Uh, it, it's a book about language uh, and it's a book about meaning inside language. Is there meaning inside language? Is there uh, not just the words that we use, but is there something that we can understand inside the words? Uh, and I think there is, and that's what the book talks about. And uh, I uh, said earlier that I'm an Orthodox Christian. Uh, actually, the translator is Christ, because he is God, but he came down to translate the meaning of life to us so that we would know, and so that we could find ourselves uh, our way back to him and I think that's a very gracious act so in a sense he came down to translate for us because we'd lost uh, track of uh, of the meaning or we couldn't quite work it out I think the whole of ancient ancient culture civilization Greece and, and Rome but mainly Greece uh, in the uh, few, few centuries before the birth of Christ were a preparation for that you know the the whole uh, concept of uh, philosophy and uh, some of the literature, Homer's Odyssey. Uh, I think these books were uh, preparation for the coming of Christ. They were a sense that you're, but you are working with something that's inferior. Philosophy is inferior to theology. Once you've reached theology, you don't need philosophy anymore. And uh, I have a new book coming out next year, Stones of Ithaca, which 
focuses directly on the presence of God in language. Can God be found in language? And I think he can. And it also looks at God in the environment. Uh, can God be found in the environment? Below the surface, I'm talking. And again, I think he can. And is there a connection between ancient Greek culture and uh, in particular, the work of Homer and the Bible and Christ? And again, I think there is. And it's very interesting for me because that's where you're, in a way, uh, tying together the the threads that I talked about earlier of literature and theology, so that they uh, come together as they should, because they are relevant to each other. How can you study literature, the word, and not uh, learn the word with a capital W? Uh, I don't think that's possible. You know, uh, I start every day of translation with prayer, uh, because I'm going to work with the word and I think it's very important I also don't see that the translation that's coming to me is isolated and I don't see it as starting with me so once you take that position there are certain things that follow from it and I think you've got to to, to, to follow those uh, and uh, that's really probably what my, my books are about the life of a translator the DNA of the English language is, is the first one and now the, the Stones of Ithaca coming out next year Stones of Ithaca is coming out uh, next year, and this is one of the uh, projects uh, projects on which you're ta you're working right now. And as uh, we finish our interview, there's two more things I'd like to ask you about. One of them is, besides this book, what other projects are you involved in right now, Jonathan? Several books in Galicia coming out next year. Some I will be translating. Some will be translated out of people. So uh, that's definitely something to look forward to. Um, and uh, I basically continue my work with language and of course I have a family like you that's also something that one needs to give attention to and to uh, spend time with and learn from so uh, life is busy but that's that's good I think I think uh, we are on a pilgrimage of sorts and so we're always uh, moving from one place to another but mainly uh, from a professional point of view my new book starts with and and then some new Galician titles, uh, some by authors that haven't been published in English yet. So I think that's very exciting. That's extremely exciting, I think, and I'm, I'll be looking forward to those uh, translations for sure. Are there any books that you can think of right now, is my final question now, Jonathan, that uh, you remember really enjoying working on as you were translating? Uh, maybe you would say that all of them are books that you enjoyed translating. Maybe you would say that none of them you truly enjoyed translating. I don't know. But if there are any in particular that come to mind, which ones would those be? Definitely. I, I would say, yes, I do enjoy all the translations I do, because I think if you're not enjoying it, there's something wrong. But yes, definitely. Uh, I loved, for example, Brother of the Wind, a young adult fiction title by Manuel Lorenzo González. Such a charming story about a boy in an Iraqi village when uh, when war breaks out and his attempts to to uh, to defend his family and uh, remain true to himself. It's such a, a charming story. The Low Voices by Manuel Rivas. I, I was very touched by this book. It's actually, uh, ironically, the book that got the least attention in national media. And for me, it's my favorite title by him. Uh, the Carpenter's Pencil is his best known book, and it's a lovely story. But The Low Voices, which is his autobiographical, an autobiographical novel, was such a, and because I know him personally, we've had so much contact over the years, he's the author I've translated most. Uh, I loved that book, and it has such a, a touching ending. I loved uh, Leticia Costas's book, An Animal Called Mist, because of this context of the Second World War, and it's so shocking. Um, I'd recently translated Sad Weapons by Marina Majoral, uh, an author who's not been translated into English, and it's about some uh, ref Spanish refugee children who are sent to Russia during the Civil War by their parents to keep them safe and what happens to them. And again, it's such a charming story that I just loved being with those characters. Uh, uh, I'm now translating Head of Medusa by Marilla Alexandre uh, about a girl who is raped uh, while at school. It's, it's quite a, a hard thing to do because uh, you feel like you don't want it to happen and it happens uh, early on in the book and then what follows. Uh, again, it's a, it's a really 
you know, good good book, an interesting book to read. And uh, I'm just very aware each time of the high quality of Galician writing. Well, I've read uh, some of uh, those books that you've uh, mentioned in the original Galician, and I can't agree more with you, Jonathan. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you here, uh, thanks to the wonders of technology and the Internet, thanks to this Skype technology that we're using and that uh, has worked really well. I've heard you as clearly most of the time as though you were right next to me here in Jackson, <laughs> Tennessee. And uh, it has truly been a pleasure to to chat with you all this time. I appreciate your time, Jonathan, and I appreciate absolutely everything you do. Keep doing it and uh, come back to tell us about it here on the written page anytime that you would like to. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jonathan Dunn. I would love to, Anton. Thank you so much for, for making this space available because that's also very important that there be a space for people uh, to discuss things as we've been doing today. And it's lovely to speak to you. Uh, I, I have the same feeling that it's almost like we're sitting in the same room, uh, the wonders of modern technology. But it's lovely that you're open to these things and you've, you've given attention to them because that's a, a very important thing, I think. So thank you to you uh, for, the, for, for the space and the time uh, to talk about these things. I'm grateful for that. Well, as long as there are uh, interesting guests who are willing to uh, spend some time sitting down and chatting with me, I'd keep doing this as long as I can. Uh, this has been a new episode of The Written Page, and our guest today, a translator and author, Jonathan Dunn, who was uh, joining us from his home in Bulgaria. Everybody out there, please check out the translations into English of Galician texts on Small Stations Press. You can find them uh, online and uh, in libraries, and I truly recommend them. Uh, I have ordered several of them for the uh, library of the university where I work, and uh, they really are uh, well worth it. Uh, this has been a new episode of The Written Page on the Anton GF YouTube channel. Uh, recorded live in Jackson, Tennessee, in the United States of America. Copyright uh, is mine, uh, year 2018. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again before too long on the written page on the Anton GF YouTube channel.